tracking there. Neil, what are you most excited about in science today? I love the search for life. It's great. It's not even my background. I have no b- background in biology other than what I osmotically gather from my colleagues in astrobiology. But I think the search for life on Mars, on Europa, one of Jupiter's yeah. moons with, yeah. a, mm-hmm. under, uh, uh, with a liquid ocean kept liquid beneath an ice sheet, liquid for a billion of years. You know, we've mm-hmm. got every place there's liquid water on Earth, there's life of some kind bacterial or otherwise so I, the search for life I'd like to think we find life in our lifetime yeah and whether we find intelligent life is another mm-hmm. criterion but any life at all would excite biology and transform biology actually Absolutely. about the ice on Mars that they just exactly just exactly that came out with that evaporated away on the on the mm-hmm. uh, Phoenix mission but also the the fact that we don't know what 96% of the universe is made of yeah. the dark right. matter dark energy okay. problem Amazing. is a huge frontier and it's, it's fun to celebrate our ignorance uh, because that's why we become scientists, to, to greet the ignorance at its doorstep. What, ama- what amazed me with that discovery was, was that in a very brief period of time, everything we knew, we thought we knew about the universe, shrunk to 5% exactly. of reality. It's like, oh, my God, there's 95%. Of, we and, of course, what... that's happened a half dozen times right. before. And, yeah. <laughs> but you, so you, you, you think, think we get used to it by now. <laughs> right. you know? It's like, oh, just another time where, where our ego gets messed over. You, know? <laughs> you, you, you think, though, that, oh, yeah, we're past that point, but you, we're not. We're right, because we're it's not like... in the middle of anything. We're not, really, we're not even made of the most common stuff. You know? That's right. Yeah. The, right. To get back really quickly to your talk, what I found really cool about it was that I've known you as – someone who promotes the beauty of science uh, in a really great way. And what surprised me today is to see you come out like full force skeptic. Like it was rip, raw. You, raw. You just, yeah. That was like a roller coaster through every pseudoscience. And you just ripped it apart. Well, yeah, I try, in, in the way only a few sentences could be right. enabled. But yeah, in this audience, I know it's a good audience and it's a skeptical audience and it's very resonant with what I do. So I had to make sure it was at least had hooks and links mm-hmm. in ways that would matter. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd be curious to see what people, I think you, you evaluate the conference at the yeah. end. I'd be yeah. curious yeah. to see what people actually write about it. But um, I was sharing with the audience my life experience being a skeptic, right. and that was all it was. On, that, on that note, I, I, it's something I have to mention. You mentioned one thing uh, during for your jury duty that just floored me because it was – it's a very funny story. You mentioned that during the voir dire process, when the uh, you the Q and A, where you're being questioned by the the various attorneys to see if you're suitable, you mentioned that you were, as an astrophysicist, you evaluate evidence, and you I think you also mentioned evaluating eyewitness testimony and how yeah, bad yeah, and, it is, and assessing the unreliability of eyewitness right. testimony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've got a story that so, so parallel to that, I couldn't believe it. I was being voir dired, and they went through the preliminaries, and they said, "Bob, what do you do?" on your spare time. Like, well, I'm a co-founder of the New England Skeptical Society. (laughs) And uh, what do you do for the society? Well, I'm actually writing an article for a newsletter about the fallibility of human memory. (laughs) They said, thank you very much. I was on the street in two minutes. I was gone just like you. They didn't want anybody like that. So let me ask you, because I would get without saying similar questions. Is this your first talk, first of all, at a quote-unquote skeptical meeting? Yes, completely. And is this this your first sort of encounter with the label of skepticism? And had you no? I'm a big supporter of the skeptics movement. I've been reading Skeptical Inquirer since 1980. God, I didn't think I could love you more. (laughs) (laughs) And I was so jazzed by it. Once I saw it, I went back and got all the back issues to 1974 or whenever it began. Zetetic. The zetetic. I didn't know what that word means, but it was still cool. And so. You know, you, and you, you, you read these, and what's amazing is how inventive mm-hmm. pseudoscience people can be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, what's next? Oh, they're eviscerating cows. Okay, yeah. the aliens are, you know, and so it keeps me current, as it would keep all of us current. But I'm a huge supporter of that movement. And uh, my, my personal goal is to get people thinking straight th- in the first place, yeah. so you don't have to sort of undo it later on. Is there one pseudoscience that drives you crazy more than others? No, they're all equally bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Yeah, I don't, I don't play favorites. They're all... Yeah, that uh, surprised me too. I thought that, you know, you might focus more on the... Um, astrology, the, maybe. Yeah, yeah, astrology, the moon, the moon hoaxes. Hoax, yeah. But, yeah, you, I mean, you no. hit up the, the, the No, swamis. because they all are evidence of a, of a faulty wiring in the brain. Right. Mm-hmm. It's the wiring that has to be fixed. You can go and try to pat, put Band-Aids on each one of these, but in the end, it's some... How, how, how do you think? Mm-hmm. And you fix right. that, and then I think all this goes. So you don't with just it. treat the symptom; treat the you underlying treat the cause. cause. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, my experience as a scientist, clinical scientist, and a, uh, a skeptic is that 
you understand the science better when you understand all the ways in which it can go wrong. Exactly. That's actually, another point. It's an undervalued aspect of this whole yeah. enterprise. So I do engage uh, people on, uh, when they write to me if I triggered their inquiry. If they just come out of the blue, I, I just don't have time. But if I wrote something or appeared on TV and that stimulated their interest, I will re- reply. Mm. Ah, and I do engage them on their issues of religion and God and UFOs and all of this. But I do that sort of private. between It's a one-on-one, and I get to see how they are thinking. Mm-hmm. And it's extremely valuable, just like you said. Very useful in, when you're conducting the very next argument that you do. So, in fact, right now I am gathering together my notes, my sort of archives, if you will, for a book that's on the very back burner called Letters from an Astrophysicist. And this is my correspondence with people who come to mm-hmm. me puzzled about mm-hmm. something that they either believe they understand or just simply don't understand. Yeah. No, I agree. And other, uh, uh, I can't remember who it is now, but somebody else observed to me that a great way to teach science is to c- confront people's misconceptions about science. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a way. I, I don't necessarily think it's the best way, but mm-hmm. I think it's a way. You don't have to confront it. You should mm-hmm. at least know that it exists so that you're not taken, you're not blindsided by a student's reaction to something Mm -hmm. that you say. Mm -hmm. You should be fully informed about all the tangled mental pathways that exist in your audience. But I don't don't necessarily espouse beginning your science class by bringing up hoaxes Mm -hmm. and things. I don't don't necessarily agree with that. No, I agree. You get to lay the groundwork. Yeah, because it's it's like the words come out of your mouth Mm -hmm. and who knows what they remember 10 years later except that you taught them about astrology Mm -hmm. in your astronomy Mm -hmm. class. Uh Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't... um, I try to not give that much cre- again I'm working on how the brain is wired yeah as the fundamental absolutely mm-hmm. yeah and I, I also find that scientists who engage to some degree in, in active skepticism even if it's just within their field are better scientists because it, it's almost like uh, if you look at a, a pathological condition that's really extreme you learn about more subtle ex- expressions of so it so pathological is odd mm-hmm. okay I just want to <laughs> Keep the one-syllable versions of words available. <laughs> <laughs> it's an astrophysicist, you remember. Yeah, we are into one-syllables. Big bang. So I need to remind you of that. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, so I agree. Yeah. yeah. So bad yeah. disease. Gets to <laughs> study bad the really disease. bad Thank stuff. <laughs> and then you could recognize the more subtle versions of it. So I think even mainstream scientists sometimes have little subtle pseudoscience. And I get some of my skepticism from, I read old textbooks mm-hmm. as how and I see and probe how people thought about something that we now take for granted. Mm-hmm. And I see how they work through it mm-hmm. and the, I, with great value to my modern mm-hmm. thinking. Your intention is to, to stay the director of the Hayden Planetarium? That's something that you see as part of your career going forward indefinitely? Uh, yeah, as long as I'm valuable to the institution. I'm, otherwise, I'll just be a scientist somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's all. I sort of recede back. And, and how has that been a platform for you? How does that help you do what you want to do? It started out as a platform because it's a visible institution. Mm-hmm. But I think what happened was the, st- the news broadcasters kept coming back because I was working on my sound bites that I was mm-hmm. handing them, and they liked my sound bites. And so they just kept coming back, whether or not I was director, mm-hmm. to the point where there have been a couple of interviews where they forgot to mention that I'm director, mm-hmm. and that you know the folks back at the museum would rather the full museum gets the credit. Yeah. But there's been some transitioning of me being noticed – for holding the title as director Mm -hmm. and me being noticed because I'm serving their, I'm feeding their appetite Mm -hmm. for the cosmos with or without the pedigree of a title. Mm -hmm. And in the end, titles shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. What should matter is the integrity and the uh, strength of your argument. Right, right. And, you know, honestly, you're becoming your own brand. I mean... Well, I try not to lead off, like I I said, if if you say, believe me, because I have this degree and I'm a PhD and I'm that and all the rest of that, if, if you if you have to lead your argument that way, yeah. you don't have an argument. Yeah, not, not as an argument from authority, just that this is a cool guy who knows how to talk about science in an interesting and fun way. I'd like to believe that by the time I'm done, you feel empowered with the information I gave you. Mm-hmm. So that you're not going to say, this is true because Tyson said it. You're going to say, this is true because I now understand it and now yes. I can present that argument yeah. without reference back to me. Mm-hmm. Right. If you have to reference back to me, I didn't do my job. Right, exactly. Teach people how to think, not what yes. to think. Yes, yes. Well, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's really been a pleasure and an honor to sit here and talking with you. I wish we had an hour more. Maybe we'll uh, rope you in in the future for a follow-up. Where do you guys record? Are you, are you, are you on, on the move all the time? We're we, on the Internet. Yeah, we record over, over Skype, over the Internet. Oh, yeah, okay. We can do that anytime you want. Okay. We'll, 
We're on the East Coast. Though. We're in Connecticut. Yeah, so. Connecticut. Yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. Well, Boston. You've heard of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to one last thing right now. Yes. Uh, in press is my next book called The Pluto Files. The Pluto Ooh. Files. Sounds interesting. Yeah, this is like odes, emails, and epitaphs in the name of a fallen planet. Oh, that's oh. a good idea. So I have my like hate mail from third graders. I thought it was just... <laughs> put in there. I thought maybe it would just be what you said at your talk. Pluto. Get over yeah, it. Get over it. <laughs> it would be a short book if that was the case. But this is actually not me hitting you over the head. It's a display of society's reaction to this demotion. That's interesting, yeah. And from the point of view of children and colleagues and the press yeah. and humorists. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a celebration of a reaction. And so that comes out in great. January. So. That's great. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Thank I'm happy you. to be on. Thank thanks you. for having me.